everyone. My name is Ken. I'm one of the third years. I'll be doing today's EMCCM lecture. Um, just um, FYI, I'm supposed to call in junior during this lecture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Anderson, uh, Dr. Beta, Dr. Newpane, Dr. Kim, and Dr. D'Souza for helping me out with this uh, lecture today. Um, so our pre-hospital history for this case, um, I got most of this information from the ACR. Um, it states there is a 40-year-old male uh, who was ambulatory on scene. Uh, he was pulled from a fire. Um, he was in no tax three, no obvious distress. Uh, his airway was patent. His uh, lungs were clear to, uh, to auscultation bilaterally, uh, neurovascularly intact. Um, these are his vitals, um, a little hypertensive, uh, tachycardic. Um, setting 88% on room air um, and noted to have um, a carbon monoxide level of uh, 15%. Um, they placed him on supplemental O2 and his oxygen improved to 100%. Um, our initial <laughs> uh, assessment, his airway appeared patent, but there was noted to be soot in the nares, pharynx, and tongue. Um, his lungs were clear, aspiration bilaterally, he was not in any respiratory distress. Um, his circulation and disability were intact. Um, these were his vitals at triage. Again, tachycardic, hypertensive, um, setting about 94% on 100% uh, oxygen. So um, can a junior come up with a preliminary problem list? Anyone can shout it out if they want to. Dr. Rosendo? Soot in his nares, you're concerned of an impending airway issue, essentially. Yep, that's, that's a good one. Hypoxia. Hypoxia, yep, that's another one. Yeah, that's pretty good. So <laughs> these are the ones that I came up with uh, tachycardia, hypoxia, uh, nasal or a pharyngeal and burn injury, and also the elevated carbon monoxide level. Um, so these were our initial uh, interventions in uh, CCT. Uh, he was placed on 100% supplemental oxygen, uh, placed on the monitor, uh, purple IV access was established. Um, a level two trauma code was called, um, FAST, was, uh, FAST was performed and uh, EKG was obtained. Um, this is from the, the IPN, um, mostly it's the same history. Um, 40 year old male found the, um, an apartment building above a large fire. Patient was complaining about headache, trouble breathing, um, endorsed alcohol use, uh, denies trauma, but otherwise limited in history. Um, past medical history, um, this was the first visit that this patient had, but um, he had a different MRN um, that the other, um, the, the provider did not uh, know about, but he has a history of polysubstance abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, seizures, but the provider did not know that at the time. Um, his physical exam, um, he was noted to be in uh, acute distress. Um, he had uh, some superficial burns to his face, his scalp, and his posterior neck. Noted to have soot in the uh, oral pharynx and nares, but no uvular edema. There's no hoarseness, no strider. Um, chest exam significant for tachycardia, uh, normal breath sounds, no wheezing. Uh, abdominal exam, normal. <coughs> Uh, extremity exam, skin exam, significant for some superficial burdens, but no signs of trauma. Um, neurovascular attack. Um, so now, based on this history, can um, a junior come up with some differential diagnosis for uh, this patient? Uh, so this is what I came up with. Um, so he had some thermal burn injuries to the skin, as well as some signs of smoke inhalation. Um, he had an elevated carbon monoxide level, so he may have some carbon monoxide level poisoning. Um, cyanide poisoning should also be under differential in any patient who comes in uh, with the smoke inhalation, um, as well as trauma and intoxication to this patient. Um, on reassessment, the patient was noted to have progressive uh, worsening hoarseness and waxing and uh, waning mental status. Um, so uh, the trauma code was upgraded to level one trauma code. Um, patient was um, intubated using um, RSI uh, with uh, video uh, laryngoscopy. 
Um, for the primary team, they noted um, carbonaceous material around the vocal cords um, on the video. Um, started on a fentanyl and propofol drip, was given hydroxycobalamin uh, 5 grams IV, and updated the TTAP vaccine. Um, bedside ETAS was done, it was negative. Uh, this is because EKJ, it's hard to say because it was only scanned in, but um, basically it's sounds tapped to 124. Um, normal access, normal intervals, nothing um, significant. Um, this was his initial DVG. Um, I'll just give you a second to briefly look at it. Um, so he was noted to have a, a metabolic acidosis with a high anion gap. Uh, his lactate is elevated at nine and um, his uh, carboxy hemoglobin level was 10%. Um, also has mild uh, electrolyte abnormalities and hyperglycemia. <coughs> um, further testing and consultations. So based on what we know so far, what kind of tests uh, would you order? Cyanide level. Yes, uh, someone mentioned cyanide level. Um, so these were the tests that were sent out, ultimately sent out. Uh, so CMP, the, the CBC, CMP, uh, COAGS, ethanol level, cyanide level. Um, they also obtained a chest x-ray, head CT, and C-spine uh, CT. Um, and these were the results of the labs. I'll give you a brief second to look through it. Um, so noted to have an elevated N9 gap, uh, some hyperglycemia, some mild anemia, uh, patient with uh, history of alcohol abuse noted to have AST, ALT elevated in a, a greater than two to one ratio. Uh, and his ethanol level was elevated at 324. Um, the cyanide level was sent, but uh, it was ultimately discontinued and there was no results uh, in the system. This is his chest x-ray, briefly look at it. Um, it's basically normal, ET tube uh, is in place. Um, his CT head, um, again, uh, cerebral atrophy, otherwise no acute pathology. Um, CT C-spine, um, no acute fractures or subluxation. Um, you can see the ET tube here. To me, it looks like the airway is a little damaged, but that was not commented on uh, in the report. Um, this was the trauma surgery uh, consultation recommendation. So they basically uh, wrote what we did. Um, intubated for airway convection, hydroxyacobalamin for cyanide high oxygen for CO toxicity, and they recommended transfer to a, a burn center. Um, so this is our updated problem list. Um, patient has airway and cutaneous burn injury, carbon monoxide poisoning, and severe uh, lactic acidosis. Um, so my talk today is going to be on uh, smoke inhalation injuries. Um, so my goal, uh, the goal of this talk is to talk about the mechanism uh, the management, and then I'm going to talk about specifically carbon monoxide poisoning and cyanide poisoning. So um, in the U.S., there's over 1 million fires a, a year, resulting in 23,000 injuries and five to 10,000 deaths every year. Um, about 22% of patients who get burns will have some sort of smoke in the inhalation injury, and if they have facial burns, it's as high as uh, 60%. And uh, pulmonary complications um, are what um, uh, usually result in deaths. They contribute to about 80% of both um, deaths, but mostly due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, so it helps to understand what is contained in smoke. Um, so smoke is um, the product of combustion. So there are three sort of big categories uh, of uh, things in smoke. So one is heat, the other is large particulate matter, such as soot. Um, and the third thing are, is uh, vapors and chemicals that are produced from the material that is burned. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the, it's the types of uh, smoke inhalation injuries are usually categorized into three main categories, um, upper airway injuries, lower airway injuries, and systemic toxicity. Um, upper airway injuries are mostly caused by the heat and thermal burns, as well as the larger particles. Um, the uh, lower airways is usually due, by, uh, due to chemical irritation. So these are slightly smaller particles <laughs> which can get past the upper airway. Um, typically there's 
uh, less uh, heat injury down in the uh, lower airways. And then the, the toxic gases in the very, very smallest particles are able to reach the alveoli and that gets absorbed systemically and causes systemic toxicity. Um, so the upper airway, um, one of the normal functions is um, of the nasopharynx and the oropharynx is to filter out large particles and as well as to perform uh, heat exchange. So when you breathe in um, hot air, it cools it off or if you breathe in cool air, it, uh, it warms it up before it, uh, it reaches your, your lungs. Um, so there's very good heat exchange of the, in the upper airways. Um, thus, most of the injuries in the upper airway is due to thermal injuries and heat exchange uh, and burns to the upper airway. Um, so these burns results in um, edema, erythema, and ulcerations uh, of the upper airway. The heat will denature proteins and destroy the epithelial layer of the upper airways. And this uh, activates a cascade of uh, inflammatory uh, molecules, including uh, nitric oxide and uh, other reactive oxygen species. Um, the nitric oxide causes vasodilation and increased permeability um, of the upper airway. Um, this results in edema and swelling of the upper airway. Um, this results in the clinical picture of um, hoarseness, strider, dyspnea, and respiratory distress. And typically, this is uh, a late sign. It's usually when the edema has gotten so bad that the airway has been compromised. And this can happen uh, even up to 24 hours after, um, after the, the in, uh, inhalation injury. Um, and also, burns to the face and neck may also cause compression of the upper airways, making it more difficult to, to uh, manage. Um, in addition, these patients may have severe burns where you may be giving them large amounts of fluid uh, based on Parkland's formula. Um, that uh, uh, the, the large amount of fluid that you give them can also worsen uh, upper airway edema. Um, so the next part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about the lower airways, which is com uh, comprised of the trachea and the bronchioles. So typically, uh, thermal injury is very rare below the vocal cords because most of the heat has been exchanged uh, from the upper airways. Um, the only, uh, the only uh, exception to this would be uh, steam inhalation injuries because uh, water has a very high heat uh, carrying capacity compared to dry air, and that can still cause burns to the distal bronchioles. But by the time the smoke reaches the trachea or the bronchial tree, it's mostly due to chemical, uh, in, uh, chemical uh, damage or uh, chemical irritation. Um, this is a bronch photo of soot that was found in a smoke inhalation patient. Um, so as you can see, there's the carbonaceous material in the bronchioles. Um, and the bronchioles are very well um, innervated. So this soot and smoke deposits uh, irritates the airway and causes bronchial constriction. This results in a lot of wheezing, coughing, and production of uh, carbonaceous sputum uh, in these patients. And if you have those signs on your patient, then you uh, can consider giving uh, bronchodilators, which I will talk about in a different slide. Uh, the chemical irritation results in damage and inflammation of the mucosal lining. Uh, and that results in a lot of profuse uh, protein-rich fluid to be secreted into the airways. And they actually can solidify and cause these casts to form. Uh, and these will block off your airway and result in atelectasis and impairs gas exchange. And again, there's going to be nitric oxide release, um, which will increase vascular permeability and vasodilation to areas of the lungs that are uh, essentially blocked off causing um, a BQ mismatch, and again, worsening hypoxemia. Um, and there's also damage to the cilia, uh, which can result in um, higher risk of bacterial infections uh, later on. Um, and the last uh, mechanism of uh, smoke inhal inhalation injury is systemic toxicity. So um, once uh, whatever's being burned in the fire, uh, it creates a lot of different toxic um, molecules which can be absor uh, absorbed into the body. Um, so each of these can be their own sort of tox lecture, but I'm going to be covering mostly carbon monoxide and cyanide. Um, 
in addition to systemic toxicity, these gases can also uh, will also displace oxygen in the alveoli and, and uh, asphyxiate the patient as well. Uh, this is just a chart of all the different uh, chemicals that you may see depending on what is burned and what is in the area of, of the fire. Um, so who do you suspect uh, smoke inhalation, uh, smoke inhalation injury in? So if the patient comes from a fire and they're complaining of dyspnea, if they're having neurological symptoms such as loss of consciousness, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, um, if they're having signs of burns to their face or lips or nasal hairs, um, if there's soot in the airway or in their um, secretions when they cough, known as melanopsis, uh, we should suspect um, uh, smoke inhalation injury. Um, it's also, especially if they're having uh, pathological respiration patterns such as coughing, strider, or hoarseness. Um, it's also important to get information regarding um, how long they were in the fire, how long the exposure was. Um, if they were in, in a closed space, like an apartment building versus outside in like a, I don't know, somewhere outside where there's a lot more open space. Um, if they had lost consciousness while in the apartment uh, and they had a prolonged uh, extrication, those are signs of uh, longer exposure and they're more likely to have uh, smoke inhalation injury. Um, the next part of my talk, I'm going to be going over airway management. Um, Dr. Fierbach gave a lecture on this, a really good lecture on this, maybe two or three weeks ago, so maybe I won't go into all the little details. Um, but um, who, who should be uh, intubated? Uh, uh, which uh, smoke inhalation uh, patients should be intubated? So there are a couple uh, uh, absolute uh, 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 indications. Um, so one, if they're impending airway or if they have actual airway obstruction, so burns to the face, to the mouth, uh, edema, or blistering of the airway. If the patient has strider, drooling, difficulty swallowing, um, it's best to take the airway uh, early. Um, the second one would be respiratory failure. That's not responding to um, non-invasive interventions. So as I mentioned earlier, they may have a lot of uh, bronchial constriction, a lot of uh, plugging of the airways. This may cause a lot of um, uh, difficulty uh, oxygenating the patient or very difficult uh, uh, difficulty uh, ventilating the patient. Uh, they may be in severe respiratory distress. If they're, they're not um, responding to uh, non-invasive measures, then they should be intubated. Um, the third indication would be um, if they're completely unfunded from um, carbon monoxide poisoning or for something else, uh, then they should also be intubated. Um, the, uh, advanced burn life support, which is like ABLS, similar to ACLS, but specifically for burns. They recommend patients who have large surface area burns, uh, 40, uh, greater than 40 to 50% to be intubated as well, um, even if they don't have any smoke inhalation injury, because they tend to develop um, generalized body edema, even the airway, regardless of having burns in their airway or not. Um, so uh, you should keep in mind that edema uh, will make the intubation uh, difficult. So the uh, most experienced person should be the one doing the intubation. Um, you want um, uh, backup devices ready because multiple attempts at the intubation will cause trauma and uh, actually worsen the edema and make it more difficult. Um, you want you know, your bougie, your flight scope uh, available. Um, Patients may have large facial burns or neck burns or chest burns, and this makes it um, hard to ventilate uh, due to uh, difficulty sealing the mask on their face, or the chest wall burns may be uh, causing rigidity of the chest wall, which makes it hard to ventilate the patient. Um, so you know, this basically is a setup for can't ventilate, can't intubate situation. So you should anticipate uh, a surgical airway. Um, just keep in mind also if they have burns on their neck, the landmarks may also be hard to find. Um, and when intubating, uh, consider using um, a larger ET tube, um, preferably greater than seven and a half or uh, 802, uh, because these patients, once they get admitted, um, they have to get bronched to diagnose the severity of their smoke inhalation injury and they're able to sort of also pull out those mucus plugs and, and uh, clear secretions of uh, the airway. Also, smaller tubes tend to get blocked up with mucus and debris, such as this photo, 
and this may result in needing to excavate the patient and to reintubate them, which is not, uh, not good, especially in birth patients. Um, for patients who suspect uh, smoke inhalation injury, but there are no signs of significant facial or neck burns, you can just consider monitoring their airway. Um, these patients should have their airway scoped either fiber optically or using DL to uh, look for signs of edema, signs of burns uh, uh, near their vocal cords. And if you do have to intubate these patients, consider um, doing an awake intubation, which Dr. Bierbach had a great lecture about. And just keep in mind, uh, the tape that we use to, uh, to hold the ET tube in place it may not stick to the patient's face if they have a lot of burns. So um, again, you don't want the patient to be excavated, so keep that in mind. Um, in any patient that you suspect smoke inhalation injury, they should be at least observed um, and monitored and have them brought uh, because uh, laryngeal edema can occur up to 24 hours later. So even if they're not in any respiratory distress at the moment, they could develop it later on. You should only discharge patients if they're completely asymptomatic and you do not believe they have any potential for smoke inhalation injury. Now I'm going to go over mechanical ventilation. Um, there's actually not as many studies that specifically looked at uh, ventilation modes for smoke inhalation. The standard of care is your typical uh, lung protective strategy. The idea is there's already a lot of irritation and uh, damage to the lungs and putting the patient on a ventilator uh, results in increased production of different cytokines and inflammation of the airway resulting in more lung damage and result, uh, putting them at a higher risk of ARDS. So the standard of care is using the lung protective strategy as outlined in the acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome network study. Um, the idea is that you use low tidal volumes and you limit the plateau pressure to decrease the amount of uh, lung injury to the patient. Um, so um, you would aim for a goal of a, a tidal volume of four to six uh, mg per kg of uh, predicted body weight. We want the plateau pressure less than 30, um, and you want to target uh, saturation greater than 92%, um, and permissive hypercapnia if their pH is greater than 7.25. Um, so the idea is that a low, uh, low tidal volume uh, and high pH is better for oxygenation. Um, but there are new, there are certain studies coming out particularly in pediatric patients with smoke inhalation uh, injury, they may actually benefit from a high tidal volume strategy. Uh, so in this study, um, they had 900 uh, pediatric patients with confirmed uh, smoke inhalation injuries, uh, confirmed via bronchoscopy. 691 of them required um, mechanical ventilation. Uh, a large portion of them were put into this uh, low tidal volume group, which they defined as nine mix per kg body weight the tidal volume, and 190 were put in this high tidal volume uh, group defined as uh, about 15 uh, mix per kg uh, tidal volume. Uh, nine and 15 are both much higher than what we would use in adults, but that's what they call high and low tidal volume. Uh, and it showed that in pediatric patients, the high tidal volume group had less ventilator days, um, less atelectasis, uh, less ARDS, but more pneumothorax. Um, nebulizer therapy, uh, as I mentioned, um, often in the lower airways, there is uh, bronchoconstriction from irritation. <coughs> and, uh, a lot of um, providers end up using things like uh, albuterol and epitropium for vasodilation, as well as inhaled epinephrine to decrease the edema of the lower airways. Um, there's not a lot of clinical evidence that it helps or it hurts, but it's just thought of as being safe medication, um, so it's often given. Um, these are other agents that you can consider giving. Um, there are ICU studies uh, specifically uh, for NAC and uh, inhaled heparin. Uh, the idea is NAC is a mucolytic agent, and it can break down some of those uh, mucus clubs that we saw uh, in the previous slide. Uh, as well as inhaled heparin can decrease the formation of those plugs. Um, and there's evidence showing that there's decreased ventilator days and decreased uh, um, severity of lung injury from the ventilator. Um, the last part of my talk is going to be, go uh, be going over systemic toxicity. Um, so in 
a uh, apartment fire, you can have all this stuff, you know, furniture, wood, plastic, whatever you have, all burned and that creates lots of toxic gas, which can be inhaled and cause uh, systemic toxicity. Um, so the first one I'm gonna be talking about is carbon monoxide. Um, carbon monoxide is colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas. Um, it's from the combustion of carbon containing compounds and causes about 80% of smoke inhalation deaths. Um, the way that it uh, works is that carbon monoxide has a very high affinity for hemoglobin. Um, it's actually 200 times higher affinity than uh, hemoglobin, essentially um, uh, not allow, uh, does not allow uh, oxygen to bind to your hemoglobin, uh, thus causing a functional anemia. Um, it shifts your oxygen association curve to the left, so this S-shaped curve is your typical um, uh, oxygen dissociation curve. Um, the sigmoidal one to the left is the one with um, car carboxyhemoglobin. So for any given um, PO2, you have a higher um, hemoglobin saturation. So your hemoglobin is not releasing the oxygen that is bound to the hemoglobin. Um, uh, carbon monoxide does not only bind to hemoglobin, also binds to myoglobin. So in the heart, this causes less oxygen delivered to the heart, resulting in ischemia, um, uh, arrhythmias, cardiac dysfunction. Um, it can uh, also bind directly to uh, skeletal muscle, resulting in rhabdo as well. And if you remember from um, biochemistry, this is the uh, electron transport chain in the mitochondria. There's one um, uh, enzyme here called cytochrome C, which is uh, part of this electron transport chain. Um, basically, the electron transport chain, what it does is allows your cells to use oxygen to produce uh, ATP. Um, so what the carbon monoxide and also, car uh, also cyanide does is it binds to cytochrome C, which also has an iron component to it, and stops it from working and makes your cells not able to use oxygen um, at all. Um, so signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, the classic story is um, you have the patients in the middle of winter with a non-functioning uh, heater or something, and they have vague flu-like uh, flu -like symptoms, so headache, nausea, dizziness, blurred vision, feeling tired. Um, those are sort of mild symptoms, but um, in severe cases, it can cause cardiac arrest, uh, respiratory arrest, seizures, coma, myocardial uh, ischemia. Um, arrhythmias. Um, so for these reasons, you should always get an EKG in patients with suspected CO toxicity um, as it increases their risk of arrhythmias and ischemia, especially if they have the baseline CAD. Um, this is the classical uh, cherry red skin that you may see. Uh, apparently it's very rare and you don't actually see it that often, so um, don't rely on this. Um, diagnosis of Car uh, carbon monoxide uh, poisoning is done via uh, serum, carb uh, serum carboxyhemoglobin levels. Um, so this is the one that's done when you get your BBG. Um, this is invasive where you have to actually take blood. Um, so a normal level is about one to 3% in a non-smoker just from background environments. Um, smokers may have levels as high as 10%. Um, EMS has these special um, pulse oxes that actually measure um, the uh, carboxyhemoglobin saturation in your, uh, in your blood using, uh, it's almost like pulse ox, but it checks um, carbon monoxide levels. But uh, ASAP specifically recommends against using these non-invasive pulse uh, cobalt sinkers um, because the idea is that they're not sensitive enough and the treatment for this, as, you, uh, as I will go into, is oxygen. Um, so you do not want to miss carbon monoxide poisoning um, because of, uh, you know, um, non-sensitive test. Um, this is the regular pulse oximetry that we use in the hospital. Just uh, keep in mind, the patient may be reading um, uh, that they're setting 100% with the hospital pulse ox, but these um, do not differentiate um, from oxyhemoglobin or a normal oxyhemoglobin. So a patient could have 25% uh, carbon monoxide levels it still reads as 100% saturation, uh, oxygen saturation on these pulse ox, because the, the wavelength of light um, cannot differentiate the two. So you have to have this uh, special one 
symptomatology um, does not always correlate with the level of um, carb uh, carboxyhemoglobin. So low, low levels tend to have mild symptoms, higher levels greater than 60 to 70% tend to have, uh, no, tend to be fatal, but in between um, the carboxyhemoglobin level does not correlate well because it depends on the patient's baseline health. So a 20% level in a healthy person may be okay, just mild symptoms, but in a person with CAD, CHF, and COPD, 20% uh, may cause them to, to um, have severe, severe symptoms. Um, also, uh, depending on when you draw it, the levels may not be accurate uh, because uh, EMS often puts these patients on high flow or, or on um, uh, a non rebreather or 100% oxygen before they get to you. By the time you draw it, the levels may be lower than uh, actually what the, the toxicity is. Um, and measuring blood carboxyhemoglobin levels does not actually measure the amount of cellular um, poisoning that we have with the cytochrome C uh, inhibition that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that's actually what causes most of the, uh, the uh, toxicity. Um, the treatment, um, as I mentioned, is mostly just oxygen. Um, this is ASEP's guideline. They recommend either hyperbaric therapy or um, normal baric high flow oxygen for acute carbon monoxide poisoning for patients. Um, the idea is that um, car uh, carboxyhemoglobin has a lower half life when there's higher amount of, uh, of uh, oxygen. Um, so, on room air, the half life is about 250 minutes. On 100% oxygen, it drops to about 40 to 60 minutes. Um, but in a hyperbaric um, uh, environment where there's greater than one atmosphere of pressure at 100% oxygen, it can be decreased you know, uh, less than 20 minutes, depending on how much pressure you are giving the patient. Um, this is what a hyperbaric chamber sort of looks like. Um, guideline, there's no real uh, universal treatment uh, criteria to decide who you want to transfer for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. These are sort of the most common ones that uh, I, uh, I was able to find. So high uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels, greater than 25%. Again, don't rely just on the levels. You should also rely, uh, um, decide based on clinical status. So if the patient has coma, they're in a seizure, uh, they're syncopizing, they have TIA, signs of cardiac ischemia, if they're pregnant, if they're severely acidotic, even if their carboxyhemoglobin level may be lower, you should still consider um, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The only real contraindication is untreated pneumothorax, which makes sense. Um, for the last part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about um, cyanide poisoning. Um, so cyanide is from uh, incomplete combustion of nitrogen-containing materials. Um, this is mostly plastics and other uh, household items that is uh, found in the home. Um, cyanide is rapidly absorbed in all roads. Um, it's very small, very little soluble, so it distributes to all your cells very quickly. And in a large enough dose, uh, it causes immediate death. Um, signs and symptoms. So it tends to be sort of um, not specific. So headaches, not knowledge of altered mental status. Um, there may be a smell of bitter almonds. Um, uh, in severe cases, it may cause hypotension, arrhythmias, loss of consciousness, seizures, cardiac arrest. Um, and uh, if, you if you happen to survive a mild poisoning, there tends to be a lot of neurologic disability, um, such as um, extra pyramidal symptoms, some dystonia, or you may be in just a vegetative state. Um, similarly to carbon monoxide, um, cyanide also binds to cytochrome C. Again, it stops your tissues from being able to use oxygen, resulting in um, um, severe lactic acidosis. Um, so a lot of times in smoke inhalation, both carbon monoxide and cyanide toxicity occur together. So carbon monoxide will decrease the oxygen delivery and oxygen utilization. Cyanide will reduce the oxygen utilization. Both of these result in a profound uh, lactic acidosis in these patients. Um, the diagnosis for um, cyanide poisoning, um, it's mostly clinical and uh, empiric treatment. 
um, you can send um, serum cyanide levels, but most hospitals, the levels are uh, not done in-house and it's often sent out. Um, so they do not come back in a timely fashion. Um, and uh, cyanide in the blood also has a short half-life. So it tends to be a lot lower um, than what uh, was actually in the patient's blood. Um, there was a study where they drew blood at the scene uh, of patients uh, 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 who were um, confirmed to have smoke exposure. And they found basically um, a lactate level of 10 is highly sensitive and highly specific for cyanide uh, uh, toxicity. Um, but just keep in mind that anything that impairs perfusion, such as hypoxia, shock, or burns, may also cause a high lactate. Um, as I mentioned, um, you, the diagnosis is mostly clinical and uh, empiric treatment. So if a patient comes in from uh, a fire and they're having altered mental status, um, decreased GCS seizures, if they have signs of smoke inhalation, so slip in the mouth or expectoration, or they have a very high lactate level, um, you should suspect um, cyanide poisoning. A uh, level greater than eight, it has a 94% uh, sensitivity. Um, any patient that comes in hypotensive, in shock, uh, in extremis from fire, just treat them empirically with the, with the antidote, which is uh, something called cyanokit. Um, cyanokit is basically uh, something called hydroxocobalamin. Um, this is first line therapy. Uh, hydroxocobalamin is a precursor to vitamin B12. Um, it, it's given IV, uh, five gram IV dosing, um, and it dissolves in all the tissues very rapidly and it binds and chelates all the cyanide to form something called cyanocobalamin, which is also known as vitamin B12, and you just excrete it in your kidneys. Um, so it's a very safe medication. Um, this is a uh, randomized um, a uh, double-blinded placebo study where they uh, infused um, hydroxocobalamin into healthy volunteers at different doses, and they compared them to a placebo. Um, and basically, they had 136 volunteers divided into different uh, doses of hydroxocobalamin, so two and a half, five, seven and a half, and 10 grams uh, IV. And they uh, observed and followed these patients for 28 days. Um, the most common uh, common uh, side effect was uh, chromateria, which is discoloration of the urine, and skin redness, which most patients receive uh, had these symptoms. But um, it's otherwise uh, fairly uh, fairly self limiting. Uh, it goes away after a couple of weeks without any intervention, and it's fairly harmless. Um, there's other less common side effects that were noted were headache, uh, injection site reaction nausea, pruritus, rash, and chest discomfort. Um, they also noted a transient increase in blood pressure, so about 20 to 27 uh, systolic blood pressure lasting about four hours, which um, is not that significant. Uh, this is a photo of what the urine looks like after receiving uh, cyanose uh, with all. Uh, just keep in mind that after a patient receives uh, this uh, cyano kit, um, the level of uh, carbon monoxide, met hemoglobin, or oxygen hemoglobin on your BBG will not be accurate. Um, a lot of uh, places, EMS can actually start cyano kits uh, uh, in the field. So once they come in and you measure their, um, their blood carbo carboxyhemoglobin levels, because you suspect maybe um, carbon monoxide poisoning with the cyanide poisoning, it may not be accurate uh, uh, in these patients. Um, here are some other antidotes, which are, um, from what I can find, are no longer uh, as used. These are sort of second line uses, but um, due to the uh, relative uh, safety and efficacy of hydroxycobalamin, um, that tends to be first line. These are other available options that you may use if you do not have cyanokit available. So the first one is sodium thiosulfate. Um, what this does is it acts as a sulfur donor uh, via this enzyme that every cell in your body has. Um, it turns cyanide into thiocyanate, uh, where you're able to excrete it uh, into uh, the kidneys and pee it up, basically. But the, this has a slower onset of action. Um, you can also give it with hydroxycobalamin, but they have to be in different IVs because the uh, medications are not compatible together in the same IV. Um, this other one, dicobalt EDTA, 
um, what this does is it chelates um, cyanide as well to form cobalt cyanide, which is less toxic. Um, each one of these molecules of um, that cobalt EDTA can bind up to six molecules of cyanide. But um, the, uh, you have to be careful because this is not bound to cyanide. This medication can also cause toxicity. Um, so um, things like seizures, upper airway edema, chest pain, hypotension, vomiting, rashes. Um, so you really should not use this medication unless you are 100% sure that the patient has severe cyanide poisoning. Um, and then the nitrites medication. So you can use amyl nitrites and sodium nitrites. Um, amyl nitrites comes in these ampules where you can crush them and you place it uh, near the, the patient's nose and let them inhale it for 60 seconds. Um, and then take it away and we do it every 60 seconds or so for a couple of minutes. Uh, sodium nitrite is also nitrate medication that you give via IV. Uh, what these nitrate uh, medications do is they induce met hemoglobinemia in the patient. Um, met hemoglobin has a higher affinity to cyanide than um, your cytochrome does or the, than your uh, hemoglobin does. Um, and that basically uh, protects you from the um, cyanide. Um, again, uh, this, you should maybe avoid it in smoke inhalation patients um, because they may have uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And if they have a lot of carboxyhemoglobin formed already and you're inducing met hemoglobinemia, you're taking away more hemoglobin from them, which may or may not be beneficial. Um, so these medications actually come together in a kit called um, a cyanide antidote kit. Uh, so it comes with the different ampules and the IVs and the uh, IV. Uh, uh, sodium disulfate and the sodium nitrites. The idea is that you start off with ampules, which have uh, rapid onset, you know, let them inhale that while you get IV access and you give them the uh, IV medication. Um, so for this patient's inpatient course, um, uh, day zero, they were transferred and admitted to Jacoby for an ICU. Uh, they noted that he had a Foley in with cherry red urine. Um, they started him on um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, on days one to seven, patient was still intubated. Um, they found him difficult to keep sedated, so they treated him for alcohol withdrawal. Um, on day eight, he was be, uh, able to be extubated to high flow oxygen, but they noted him to be um, confused and agitated. Um, days nine to 12, patient developed leukocytosis to 27. He uh, was persisted, uh, persistently tachycardic. They worked him up, but everything came out negative. Uh, continued to be agitated. He kept asking to leave AMA. They did a reversible dementia workup, which was also negative. The consult did psych, and they said uh, he had no decisional capacity. Um, day 13, they discharged the patient. Um, this was in their discharge summary. Um, as of this time, there's no clear explanation for his mental status, his leukocytosis, or persistent tachycardia. Uh, differential includes neurologic sequelae of carbon monoxide poisoning, early dementia, ICU delirium versus primary psychiatric diagnosis. But uh, he was discharged and there have not been any clinic follow-ups or anything that can find. Um, so in summary, um, in patients with smoke inhalation injury, if you have signs of airway obstruction or respiratory failure, you should try to intubate them early, uh, anticipate uh, a typical airway, um, or uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, the treatment is just 100% oxygen. Treatment for cyanide toxicity is hydroxycobalamin, which is very safe and effective. Um, and that's it. Any questions? That was a good, really great talk. Um, I'm surprised that this patient didn't get the cyanide kit by uh, EMS because if Sydney has it on the, on the ambulance, then they usually give it to every patient they pull out of the fire. So a lot of times your patients are gonna come in with the cyanide kit already hanging. Um, so just be, be prepared for that. Um, and in terms of uh, carbon monoxide, it's a uh, here nor there. I think it's almost, you're almost never gonna get a patient um, who's gonna die from carbon monoxide poisoning because usually they're gonna die already before they get to the ED. And if they get to the ED, really what you're doing is trying to prevent them from getting long-term sequela from the carbon monoxide. And that's really the key. That's why you're going to try to give them the oxygen, try to wash it out as much as possible, and that's why you're going to do the hyperbarics. You're not saving carbon monoxide patients probably in ED. It's going to be very rare you're going to get a patient who's so high who's going to, who's going to survive um, already um, 
it's really going to be preventing their like long-term headaches and other neurologic stuff they can get from. And that's going to be like the board question. Why do you treat the, treat the why do you do hyperbaric or carbon monoxide? It's really to prevent the, the neurologic swelling. Yeah, there was a Cochrane review looking at uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and neurological uh, outcomes, and there's no benefit apparently. But um, no, ASAP also doesn't recommend it because there's no benefit. Right. So, it, but it, it really that's it's, it is a controversial issue, but that's the only going to be the only reason to do it really. Um, and even though there's no data to support it, I, I think the poison control center still here still likes it, so they still will push push you forward if you talk to poison control. Um, they'll still probably play the transfer for hyperbaric. Yes. Um, do you know, do most burn centers like have hyperbarics with them or you have to choose one or the other? Like for this patient, I would probably have picked the burn center over the hyperbarics unless they're both the same play. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then for this patient too, where the, the level was only like 10% and like, Maybe they have cyanide toxicity because of the lactate, and they also maybe have. Do you know like what was the specific indication for hyperbarics for this patient? Like, did they ever document why? Um, the question was, um, do all bird hunters have a hyperbaric oxygen uh, chamber? That I actually don't know the answer to. No. Uh, Dr. Bukhaji says no. No, but there are there are uh, centers that have hyperbarics that are not burn centers, right? Those are usually for wound control. <laughs> Uh, you know, anaerobic infections, but the, you'd always go with the hyperbarics first, and then they could be transferred to a burn center. That's the uh, the acute um, the acute problem right there, and that was very comprehensive, very comprehensive. You did a, you did a really great job. The only thing I want to add is that for chronic exposures like firefighters, you might want to take that down a little bit when you make the decision to dive them. So a firefighter who's going to have chronic exposure to carbon monoxide. Hopefully not, but they do much more than than white people do. You might want to you might want to dive them at a little bit of lower level than you would to somebody else who doesn't get exposed that much. Um, for this patient, they they did not mention why uh, it was just a one liner uh, consult hyper hyperbaric oxygen, and he received it. They didn't really talk about why. I, I think Jacoby is the only place that has a, a hyperbaric that, that can handle a critically ill patient, like an intubated patient. Right, like some places are just like big tanks and stuff, and it's a little bit different. But I think Jacoby might be the only place that can handle like the really sick intubated patients. My understanding. Because the, <laughs> the cyanide toxicity like lower your pressure to hyperbarics, or it was like an altered mental. Yeah, hyperbaric probably isn't going to do much for most of your patients, honestly. Yeah. So it should not be probably your focus on a lot of your patients. If, they, if, they have, if, they're, if they're more complicated, you should probably just deal with that rather than. You know, chances are if somebody's going to die carbon monoxide, they're going to do it before they get to the ED. Thank you for my I just wanted to comment on the Jacoby hyperbaric chamber. I think that's the only chamber in the tri state area that can take up to three intubated patients at the same time. Yeah. I think that's the biggest uh, draw for it. Most other burn centers have a mono chamber, which is the picture that uh, Ken had in the thing, where a patient goes in without the position. At Jacoby, when the patient goes in, the physician actually goes in with the patient uh, in the chamber. I mean, that's the major difference. And they can do up to nine uh, sitting patients, but they're not intubated in three intubated patients. And they have an empty chamber to take a position. The next closest one is Nassau County Medicine, which we've gone to as a uh, wilderness medicine tour. Great. All right. Excellent job.